I'm Richard Bush. Thank you all for coming today. Um, let me start with a personal note. Uh, it was my privilege to be the director of this center for um, 16 years. Um, I was actually very fortunate to get the position. I, at that time, I was a Democrat in a Republican administration, and I was getting word that uh, a very wealthy Republican woman wanted my job. Um, <laughs> And just at that point, just at that point, um, Jim Steinberg, who was then vice president of the foreign policy program, came to me and said, Bates Gill, the founding director of our Center for Northeast Asian Policy Studies, is moving to CSAS for reasons that I cannot understand. Um, and we need a director. And I knew the way Washington worked that you only get one chance to work at the Brookings Institution, if that. And if you get that chance, grab it. So I grabbed it, and I've been here ever since, and I've been very fortunate. One of the reasons I'm very fortunate is the Visiting Fellows Program that we had for a number of years uh, after I assumed the directorship. Um, I have some of my closest friendships uh, with uh, alumni of that program, some of them on the stage here. Some returned to Asia, some stayed in the United States. Uh, all that's fine, whatever. But um, those friendships I really value, and it's always uh, wonderful to see the alumni of that program. Um, this part of the program is uh, to look back and how, examine how um, Asia or different parts of Asia have changed in the last 20 years. We have a great set of panelists. Um, uh, Yun Sun, uh, who will speak first and is on the far right, is a senior fellow, fellow and co-director of East Asia programs and the director of the China program at the Henry L. Stimson Center. She was a visiting fellow here in the fall of 2011. 2011. Uh, Toshio Nakayama is a uh, um, professor of American politics and foreign policy in the Faculty of Policy Management at Keio University in Japan. Uh, he's currently a Japan fellow at the Wilson Center. He was a visiting fellow here in 2005 uh, to 2006. Um, Suk Jung Lee um, is professor of public administration at Sung Kyun Kwan University in Korea and the director of its East Asia Collaboration Center. Um, she was um, in the first class that uh, I and my staff were um, sort of fully responsible for picking, and uh, when we picked her, we did well. Uh, this was 2003 to 2004. Jonathan Stromseth was not uh, a visiting fellow from Asia. Um, he is our uh, Lee Kuan Yew uh, chair in Southeast Asian studies, but we figured we better cover Southeast Asia. Um, Jonathan worked for um, over a decade uh, in Asia uh, uh, for the Asia Foundation, um, so he might as well be... Um, uh, from Asia. Finally, uh, Yuan Gang Wang is professor of political science at uh, Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. He was a visiting fellow here uh, from 2005 to 2006. Um, the plan of March is that each of my friends will speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, maybe we'll have some discussion on the stage and then open it up to uh, discussion. So first, Sun Yun. Thank you, Richard, for the invitation to be here, and thanks to uh, to Maria for having me today. I was a visiting fellow with uh, what was then called the CNAPS, uh, Center for Northeast Asia Policy Studies, back in 2011. And the topic that I worked on while I was with Brookings was the national security uh, decision-making process of, uh, of China, and this was eight years ago, and I was looking at the national security decision-making of the then Hu Jintao administration. And the topic that I have been assigned today is to talk about how China's foreign policy objectives uh, 
uh, have changed in relation to its domestic politics um, in the past two decades. And I was looking at Xi Jinping's national security decision making and realized that how big a difference um, um, it, has, uh, it has happened in the Chinese context. So apparently in the past two decades, China's, the changes to China's foreign policy is uh, probably the most dramatic and the most conspicuous among all the East Asian countries. So from keeping a low profile, the mantra that uh, Deng Xiaoping decided, starting from 1979 to the now very assertive foreign policy of China, China's uh, assertiveness or China's position on its, in, uh, its position in East Asia has changed dramatically. So in the past, China had more or less a certain extent of respect to the U.S. leadership and even U.S. hegemony in the Asia region. But now you, uh, China takes no, um, take, uh, leaves no, no stones unturned to uh, compete with the United States for its leadership in the in the region. And furthermore, China is also trying to uh, the words that the Chinese would use is to displace or at least weaken the U.S. influence in the periphery of uh, of China's of China, and also the U.S. ability to influence countries, China's neighbors' uh, decision making. So according to Xi Jinping's proclamation, Mao Zedong was a leader that made China independent, and Deng Xiaoping was a leader that made China rich, and now he is going to be the leader to make China strong. So basically, all the policy behaviors that we have observed about China in the past, since 2013, they are the uh, concrete reflection of the, uh, of the desire for China to become a strong nation. So China's desired international order or its objective as defined by President Xi Jinping is a community of common destiny for all mankind. And this concept is very much embedded in China's traditional vision of an ideal world order, resembles hegemonic stability theory, but with a very different set of moral codes of the hierarchy. So the concept of Tianxia system, all under heaven, envisions a world centered on and dominated by a superior and morally benevolent country or civilization. And in the Chinese context, it is the Middle Kingdom. The, hege the hegemon superiority in military and economic power forms a foundation for peace and stability through deterrence and coercion. And the moral superiority, as primarily demonstrated by the hegemon's benevolent provision of public goods, anchors the desirability of the hegemonic hierarchy among other states, at least from the Chinese perspective. So in this framework, we can find the origin of most of China's foreign policy behavior today. So for example, the One Belt and One Road, or the Belt and Road Initiative, of course, is primarily targeted at the absorption of China's domestic overcapacity in its economy. But externally, Belt and Road Initiative also seeks to demonstrate China's benevolent intention, China's provision of public goods through, um, through its, for example, infrastructure projects and its financing in order to find eventually expand China's influence over the decision-making of recipient countries in the Belt and Road. Secondly, about the U.S. presence or the U.S. role in the, in the region, China has reached a much more cl clarified uh, demand about the uh, U.S. role in the in the Asia region, and this traces back to the SICA conference in 2014, when Xi Jinping made the, made the statement that Asian affairs eventually will have to be managed by Asian people, and the problems of Asia eventually will have to be solved by the Asian people. So in the Chinese foreign policy design, although China does not seek the exclusion of the United States from the Asia region, but China does define itself as a great power in Asia, and U.S. roles and operations in Asia need to follow the rules and the limits designated by China. On the fourth we call the hot topics in East Asia from North to South, North Korea, East China Sea, Taiwan, and South China Sea, we can identify clear intention on China's part to undermine U.S. regional presence. Although in the name of the China's national security, because these areas are close to China's homeland, projecting into China's future regional strategic outlook, China might be satisfied for now with the U.S.-China G2 at this point. But down the road, it is uncertain at the most, that China will welcome a U.S. as China's peer in the Asia region. So last but not least, China's foreign policy under Xi Jinping has defied the rule after the Cultural Revolution about the 
export of the ideology, and the China is actively promoting the China model, or what the Xi Jinping would call the China pass to development in the less developed countries and developing world. So, according to Xi Jinping, the banner of socialism with Chinese characteristics is now flying high and proud for all to see. It means that the pass, the theory, the system, and the culture of socialism with Chinese characteristics have kept developing. And planning a new trail for other developing countries to achieve modernization, and China believes it offers a new option for other countries and nations who want to speed up their modernization while preserving their independence. And it offers the Chinese wisdom and the Chinese approach to solving the problems facing mankind. So. For all this development, when we talk to Chinese interlocutors, we hear the explanation that、um, Xi Jinping needs to pursue a more assertive foreign policy in order to push forward his difficult domestic reform in China. That Xi Jinping needs more credits from foreign policy arena to boost his domestic popularity, in order to defeat his political opponents, to pursue anti-corruption campaign, and to deepen the economic reform in China. So, in this sense, the Chinese explanation is that Xi Jinping's foreign policy is an extension of Xi Jinping's domestic politics instead of China's international ambition. But this dichotomy does not necessarily hold water, because these two dimensions are not mutually exclusive. Xi Jinping might be motivated to pursue a assertive foreign policy because of his domestic political need, but it does not mean that China's foreign policy does not pursue the the result of such assertiveness. Assertiveness. For the Chinese policy community, the biggest opportunity and the biggest challenge to this foreign policy course lies in the United States. So, overall, the Chinese assessment is that. The changing dynamics between China and the United States eventually originate from the changing power balance between the two, from what they see as the relative decline of the United States vis-a-vis -vis China, and also vis-a-vis -vis itself. So, on issues, especially in the Asia region, China sees the timing and the geography are both on China's side. And they do believe there will be a day that the United States is exhausted by its commitment in the region, so far away from its homeland, and it will pack up and leave. So by then, all the countries in the region will more or less fall in order, the order that China defines. So currently, the U.S. attitude was U.S. policy towards its allies, U.S.'s resources, and its willingness to spend those resources to build up and strengthen its regional part regional partnership and alliances system, as well as the U.S. attitude towards free trade in the region, have all been believed by the Chinese to are providing opportunity for China's further ascension. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion later. Thank you. Well,、uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Miria. And、uh, it's really nice to be back to Brookings. You know, it was、uh, 15 years ago almost when I was here, and I was really nervous、uh, being on the podium, the Brookings, and I'm kind of still nervous. That, you know, surprised that I'm still being, and I'm nervous that I'm up here.、Uh, it's it's like 20 uh, uh, 20 years in one minute, right? So it's 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 that's easy, I guess. And、uh, this is a very uh, uh, sort of an, uh, a nice day for in Japan, or a, a day of transition, right?、It's, uh, because we just entered. This is the first day of Reiwa, in fact. So it's a it's a good timing to sort of look back, I guess. And twenty years ago, I guess sort of Japan more or less accepted the world would more or less come together. You know, the, the theory of convergence,、right? not as、uh, optimistic as、uh, you know the Europe was. Because there was the issue of、uh, North Korea, you know,、uh, China's wise was uncertain.、Uh, but you know, at the time, the, the term,、uh, you know,、uh, Japan-China friendship actually made sense. Right? These days, we don't talk about that too much anymore. But 20 years ago, it, it made sense, and we never thought、uh, sort of the North Korean issue would would drag on this long. So we also, you know, sort of a slow convergence、uh, in in our region and in Japan in particular. But、uh, 9/11 sort of shattered that, and also, you know, our unexpected,、uh, unexpected, you know, rapid and from a Japanese point of view, uncertain and sometimes hegemonic rise of China uh, uh, sort of worried us a lot. And also, you know, this hasn't been determined yet, but what 
we see the tendency in this country, whatever you call it, retraction or retrenchment or reluctance, that is also a huge concern as well. Uh, domestically, you know, the, uh, the, the huge, uh, the biggest concern is the uh, decline in the population. Uh, the Japanese go government is trying to sort of tackle with that issue, but it hasn't been that uh, a success, uh, a successful up until now. There's the issue of physical uh, uh, deficit, and also the sort of the Japanese industry hasn't been uh, sort of adapting to the sort of newly emerging sort of industrial sort of structure. So that's, that's another uh, uh, problem as well that we've been dealing with for, for the past 20 years. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the uh, 2011 uh, March uh, earthquake had a huge impact, not just in terms of natural disaster, but it had an impact on the Japanese psyche. Right? Because uh, our goal, purpose was always economic development. But is that really the right way to go? So it, it started sort of a new soul-searching uh, process in 2011. So uh, looking back, the past 20 years was a difficult uh, uh, 20 years for Japan. And from looking at it from an outside, maybe y you see a Japan sort of relatively declining. But I think, like I said, <clears throat> it's a sort of a start of a, uh, a sort of a redefinition of Japan in the coming years. I think that was the, the period that we've experienced for the past 20 years. And uh, Richard gave a uh, 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 some couple of questions, so I'll try to sort of answer that question and use my uh, uh, seven or six minutes that I have left. And uh, uh, he asked us about, uh, uh, you know, how Japan's sense of security changed over the past two decades, uh, particularly with respect to uh, uh, China and North Korea. And definitely, in terms of policy and in terms of, in terms of institution and in, in, in terms of, you know, at the sort of popular level of how sort of we understand the region, there has been a sort of a, a direction towards robust defense posture. I think that's a strong consensus within Japan. And this is not just to sort of, you know, counter or complicate uh, China's hegemonic rise. It's in a way to convince the Americans and make force Americans to choose the U.S. by us becoming more uh, effective ally. Okay? So it's not just about sort of uh, you know, complicating China's rise, but being more reliable partner to the U.S. I think that's the, the important thrust of Japan's you know, increased uh, robust defense posture. Uh, and in terms of the uh, uh, U.S.-Japan alliance, uh, you know, the necessity was always realized. But if you think about the, uh, the situation that we're facing now in Northeast Asia, uh, there's a, uh, a, a rising sort of consensus that Japan cannot handle the situation alone. So we need to sort of convince the United States that U U.S. has to be the resident power, uh, resident sort of power uh, in, in Northeast Asia. And so in the 90s, some people were talking about sort of alliance adrift, you know, alliance losing a purpose. But I think these days uh, th there's none of that. So I think that kind of thinking sort of underlies uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe's sort of you know, strategic hugging of uh, President Trump. So for the Japanese people, even under the, you know, Trump administration, it's business as usual. You know, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit. It's, it's to sort of convince the U.S. that you have to be here. And, and, and we will deal the situation together. Uh, and uh, the issue about Koizumi and Abe and what kind of influence, uh, sort of impact they've had on Japanese politics and on security, uh, that's, it's, it's really difficult to generalize. I think you can sort of divide this past 20 years into sort of four periods, right? There was the Koizumi period, uh, the DPJ, Abe's second term, and the rest, right? including the first term of Prime Minister Abe. And I think uh, the one which had the most negative consequence was, I think, uh, DPJ, which uh, took power in 2009. Not that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm taking a partisan position, because it totally shattered this vision of Japan sort of tran transitioning into a decent sort of two-party system. Right? That uh, uh, sort of idea and confidence is, is totally gone, you know, even still now, you know, after a couple of years after the DPJ. And uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Koizumi, he was really popular, uh, and he was very well known, uh, one of the most well known uh, leaders that we've had, I guess. But in terms of policy, and especially on security policy, there hasn't been that much. Uh, compared especially to what Prime Minister Abe has done in his second, uh, his, his second term. 
So I wouldn't say uh, Prime Minister Abe's, uh, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi's sort of, uh, you know, uh, effort on foreign and security policy was all that consequential. So when I, when I was at uh, Brookings uh, 15, uh, 14, 15 years ago, it was the Koizumi period, and he sort of kept on going to the Yasukuni annually, and people were sort of almost accusing me of, you know, Japan becoming a dangerous nation, you know, that there's a, there's a rise of nationalism in Japan. Uh, that was what uh, people talked about. But now, if you look at the position of Japan, it's, it's kind of different from, 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 from like 14, 15 years ago, right? So now Japan is being talked as a, you know, defender of liberal international order, according to Professor Eikenberry. I think that's a bit sort of overwhelming. And there was an article just in Politico, uh, Prime Minister making a speech in Europe, and the, the, the article says that if he had d delivered that speech in English, he could have been the best EU leader we could have, right? <laughs> and the, uh, the, the friends of Europe are not in the West, but it's in the East, right? So it's a total different perception, I think, uh, of Japan uh, uh, these days. A bit of an exaggeration, right? Uh, I think, you know, it is a fact that there's many reasons. The fact that Japan is a homogenous society and maybe we have a very effective sort of, you know, wall to a certain degree. Uh, uh, but, but anyhow, Japan does not sort of, we, we're not seeing the rise of, you know, nationalist, populist, you know, sentiment in Japan. And, uh, and so, yes, we're doubling down on the alliance, you know, uh, hugging uh, the Trump administrations and uh, doubling down on the alliance, but at the same time, we're doing many of the sort of the global governance issue that U.S. is not interested in. For instance, working on TPP without the U.S., uh, CP, uh, CPTPP, right? Uh, and uh, e uh, like uh, sort of uh, uh, EPA with EU, uh, issues on global sort of uh, uh, global warming uh, and, uh, you know, all the, all, all the other issues. So it's not that just Japan is just doubling down on Trump and hugging Mr. Trump, but we're doing many other things. And I think that's possible because we don't see this, you know, populist nationalist sentiment rising in Japan. So uh, speaking, uh, you know, uh, without a sort of a fear of, you know, uh, simpl simplification, uh, I think, uh, you know, the 20, uh, this coming 20 years is a sort of like a preparation period for the re-rise of Japan, not in terms of becoming a superpower, right? We, we, Japan is not a superpower. But we'd like to think ourselves as a, a, a you know, a, a country uh, with a, uh, sort of scope, uh, a sort of a global scope, right? And and at least you know uh, uh, strongest uh, uh, sort of a, a vision of that in uh, a Asia region. So I think the next coming year would be the preparation period for Japan's re rise in terms of Japan becoming a country with a global scope. And I'll end here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Suk Jung Lee from South Korea. I have only 10 minutes, but I'd like to share my special feelings with you. Um, I was a former fellow from 2003 and 2004. I am the first batch of recruitment under the 16-year rule of uh, Richard Bush of the center. And then at that time, Richard and uh, my good friend, Sharon Yanagi, sitting back there, and Kevin Scott, we all like a family. So, I brought my two kids. They still remember their fond memories of uh, their related family to Brookings Institution Center. So I'm very happy to be part of this 20th celebration. And I'm sure under the new leadership of uh, Media Solis, the center will continue to rise. Okay. Um, I am asked to reflect for the last 20 years of uh, Asia from the Korean perspective. If I uh, recollect the past 20 years for South Korea, it was uh, quite a continuous rise. We had a very difficulty uh, for the Asian financial crisis from 1997-1999, and we thought it's uh, almost the second Korean war, economic war. Uh, however, we quickly uh, recovered from the crisis, and then South Korea has emerged as one of a very strong middle power and also very vibrant democracy in Asia Pacific region. Um, and at the same time, it's not only South Korea, North Korea has risen in their own, own fashion. <laughs> and, uh, 
for the uh, last 20 years already, there is a succession of the Kim family to the third generation in 2011. So Kim Jong-un is ruling the country. Uh, and uh, ever since 2011, with his uh, strategy of Gyeongjin, uh, so um, with the nuclear power, military power, and, and at the same time pursuing the economy. Um, however, uh, I would say, even though the peace between two Koreas um, has been maintained, um, their rise as an almost de facto nuclear state throughout the um, six nuclear tests from year 2006 and year 2017, and a lot of frequent missile uh, tests. Um, you know, it was a kind of very capable uh, nuclear state that can threaten the mainland USA. So, uh, um, of course, uh, most of South Koreans uh, perceive North Korea uh, very continuous way in several aspects. Um, the, the human rights condition in North Korea is pretty bad, but economically, North Korea has been sustaining. And I heard from some economists saying that the, actually Changmadang, the market economy, informal economy in North Korea, has been pretty good despite all the sanctions. Uh, uh, and then and we have a summit um, between uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un twice, but uh, denuclearization has been stalled. So um, now, yes, uh, Koreans very much cherish peace between two Koreas, and 2018 was a turnaround from the 2017 uh, escalating tensions. But now we are quite a little bit disappointed uh, because summit diplomacy uh, is not going well. So we'll see how this divided nation will strive for the peace uh, in, in the peninsula and also in Asia in region. And also South Korea is one of the strong military allies of the USA. Uh, you know, whenever I hear talks from the ambassadors and diplomats from USA, they like to say uh, Korea is a multi um, the partner to USA. Of course, we have a very strong military alliance relationship. We have a good trade relationships. And, and furthermore, in terms of value of democracy and market economy of the South Korea and, and USA, value very much so. However, um, these days, you know, we worry some. Um, um, it's not shift of Korean perceptions and attitude, but it's a rising concerns. Um, actually, the concern started when uh, President Trump uh, ran a presidential race uh, in the year 2016 because when he was campaigning, uh, he mentioned uh, he wanted to you know, withdraw the US soldiers. And also when the, the, the Mr. Woodward's uh, book, The Fear, came out, and he, Trump, President Trump has mentioned again about the pulling out the US soldiers from uh, South Korea. And last year, right after the uh, Hanoi, uh, the, right after the Singapore summit at the press conference, uh, President Trump has mentioned again that uh, it's a very expensive war game. And that he, even though it's not now, he wants to bring the U.S. soldiers back home. So, you know, many Koreans, uh, uh, you know, began to worry about the continuous American commitment to the alliance to, uh, with, with the South Korea. And so we have to, we are waiting and, and looking at, wait and see whether the problem of uh, President Trump's transactional approach to the alliance, because it's not only the alliance with South Korea, the alliance with Japan, and also with NATO, okay, about, you know, his too much concern about money. Uh, so we increase it 8% of uh, um, uh, the money to assist U.S. forces in Korea. So I think the uh, South Korean government is sharing about uh, slightly less than $1 billion U.S. dollars to, to support uh, the, um, the U.S. forces in Korea. Um, that kind of, uh, kind of uh, transitional approach, because we strongly believed the U.S. rock alliance is based on values, but now um, many things are, you know, talking approach from this financial perspective. So that worries um, many uh, South Korean uh, security experts. Um, so we see, um, you know, 
uh, especially the how the U.S. will see the the utility and value of the alliance with South Korea, as uh, more so the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy is it is is aiming at deterring uh, China. Uh, I suspect the value of uh, alliance uh, with South Korea can be diminished because South Korea's position has been very much ambivalent in deterring China in in Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific region. So um, after North Korea issues, and that's the very much very structural and then long-term worries of uh, of South Korea. Okay, lastly, um, South Korea is very, very vibrant, and, and, and we are ideologically uh, somewhat divided the country between progressivists and between conservatives. And uh, throughout the industrialization, our leadership, our role, uh, came from more conservative force. But after democratization, if you look at the last 20 years, we, uh, we had a progressive 10 years, 10 years of Kim Dae-jung and Noe Myung government, and then we have nine years of conservative uh, government by Lee Myung-bak and Park Geun-hye. Now and again, we have uh, Moon Jae-in progressive government. So I'm asked how the progressive, how the ideological difference of government uh, can uh, affect South Korea's uh, external policy, foreign policy. It's, it's an interesting question, but it's, it's difficult to uh, generalize. But um, despite this uh, danger to, to for the generalization, I would say usually conservative government tend to have a more uh, international and global policy. Uh, on the other hand, the progressive government are more, how can I say, concentrate on, on um, inter-Korean relations, uh, and also more domestic issues, uh, you know, from the authoritarian legacy and how to promote democracy and so forth. I guess the, the North Korea policy is the is the most salient case. Uh, you can find uh, the ideological difference of, of government. Usually, progressive government emphasize improving relationship with North Korea. Uh, and also in uh, trying to, to support uh, North Korean economy. And the conservative government tend to emphasize more national security, um, the, how to diminish the threat from North Korea, and also they emphasize cross-consultation with the uh, ally uh, USA. Uh, so uh, definitely there are uh, the, the differences by uh, uh, ideologically different government. However, even that said, there is not much room for uh, the substantial difference because the alliance with the USA is so important for South Korea's national security. So whether the government leadership is from conservative force or progressive force, um, the, the maneuvering space is not that different. Okay. And the, how about the other countries? Uh, Japan policy, uh, that's unfortunately, um, you know, regardless of uh, ideological difference, uh, often the Korean government uh, uh, tend to pose uh, the very nationalistic anti-Japanese uh, uh, foreign policy. It's not because uh, the uh, this remaining anti-Japanese sentiments is more like a, a, a democratization effect because um, many things regarding the, the how you, we have uh, managed it, uh, comporting women issues and also forced labor issues. And those issues are kind of dividing South Korea and Jap- uh, Japan, uh, two most critical allies to USA over the years. But it's, it's not just uh, for the government position. It's more like a you know, the democratization of a society because many NGOs and human rights activists are asking to address the, these issues. Uh, so uh, that is uh, also uh, one thing. And China issue is interesting. Um, I don't see much uh, the, the impact uh, of uh, the ide- ideological propensity of uh, ruling government over China policy. Uh, I think a leadership uh, between 
Chinese leaders and Korean leaders have been more um, based on chemical, the chemistry of, of, of leaders. For example, the, the, our former impeached uh, President Park Geun-hye had a great chemistry with Xi Jinping. Uh, however, you know, with uh, all this uh, the fallout uh, following the deployment of thought, um, that became soured. So um, uh, I would say uh, the, the, the impact of ideological difference over China policy is not that great. Okay, so let me stop here, and I'll try to, to answer the questions. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, Richard and Maria, uh, for the opportunity uh, to be here. It's great to be back. I have fond memories 14 years ago, and Toshi was my cohort, so it's good to uh, have a chance to, uh, to catch up with him again. So my assignment here today is about Taiwan, and I'll organize my presentation in terms of the three questions that I was given. First, Taiwan's sense of security. Secondly, how skillful are Taiwan's leaders in reassuring China? And number three, how do I assess the quality of Taiwan's democracy? Right. So first, um, Taiwan's sense of security, uh, to put it mildly, is not getting any better. And, and the reason is very simple. It's because of China, right? Because of the rise of China, China's capabilities uh, are increasing across the board. So when I say capabilities, it's not just about military capabilities, it's also economic capabilities, diplomatic capabilities, and cyber capabilities, right? And so in terms of military capabilities, we all know that the, the military balance of power in the Taiwan Strait uh, has consistently tilted in the favor of China and over the past 20 years. And so that puts Taiwan in a difficult position. Right? And China recently has conducted what it calls encirclement patrols. So basically flying airplane around the island as a way of uh, intimidation. And China is doing the same in Senkaku, you know, uh, with regard to Japan as well. Right? And not long ago, two Chinese fighter jets just crossed the media line of the Taiwan Strait. Right? And, and so those military pressures are increasing. Right? And economically... China's economic capabilities have also increased. And, and, and that puts Taiwan in a difficult position because that Taiwan's economy is very much dependent on China today. Right? China is Taiwan's largest trading partner and also the destination, the largest destination of Taiwan's uh, outbound investment. So a lot of Taiwanese mis- business people are operating in China now. So that puts them in a, uh, in a situation in which that they might become uh, a pawn or, or some tool for China right, to put pressure on in order to force Taiwan to make political concessions. And, and the recent example is South Korea, right? When the, the thought that the anti-missile uh, defense system was deployed, right? China basically punished Latte, the, the South Korean business uh, uh, operating in China, right? And, and so it might do the same thing to Taiwanese business as well. Right? And diplomatically, uh, China's global clout has substantially increased. You can see this at AIIB or the one bill, one row, and recently Italy just joined the OBOR, right? And, and so now many countries will just defer to, uh, to China um, on the Taiwan issue, right? So since 2016, China has taken away six of Taiwan's diplomatic allies. Now Taiwan has only 17. And also forced uh, airlines to change its name. So like Air Canada changed Taiwan to Taiwan, China, China. Right? And it was only the U.S. airline refused to do so, but they just leave out Taiwan, just if you search it's Taipei only and no country. Right? And, and so those are kind of things you are seeing uh, China is increasingly doing that. And so, and so this kind of diplomatic isolations are not just about stealing away Taiwan's diplomatic allies, but it's also about downgrading existing relations. Right? So one example is in 2017, Nigeria, the Taiwan Trade Office was forced to get out of, to move out of the capital of Abuja and move to Lago uh, in another city. Right? So basically, you are put uh, in a not an isolated place, but away from the capital. Right? So those are the things that China can do today. Right? And so there are also other type of capabilities, which I'm not going to get into, uh, cyber capabilities, influence operations, information warfare, and some call use sharp power, all those kind of things. And China's capabilities have increased uh, across the board. But among all these developments, there's a silver uh, silver lining, and that is the strengthening of U.S.-Taiwan relations. So in a way, U.S. support could offset 
south of China's increasing capabilities. So this year is the 40th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act, and which is American domestic law, but it regulates uh, U.S. relations with Taiwan. And last year, Congress passed the Taiwan Travel Act to allow high-level uh, visit between the two countries. And there's this area, right? Uh, the Asian Reassurance Initiative Act, and more recently, the, uh, the Taiwan Assurance Act is in the works. So, so as China continues to rise, uh, I think the United States will have strong incentives to elevate Taiwan's strategic values as part of the, uh, the free and open uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. And also, both countries share the common interest in maintaining the balance of power uh, in East Asia, and they also share the same democratic values. And so U.S. can also help Taiwan reduce its uh, economic dependency on China because of the China factor, Taiwan is isolated from all kinds of regional trade agreements. And so, but by, by maybe signing something like the, uh, the U.S.-Taiwan bilateral trade agreement, they might help Taiwan to break out of the, the kind of economic isolation in East Asia. So there are a lot of things that, uh, that the U.S. can do. And secondly, uh, have Taiwan's leaders become more skillful in reassuring China? And the short answer is yes and no. And if you look back 20 years ago, right, uh, in 1999, there was the year of the uh, President Li Denghui, and he talks about the special state-to-state relations. I think, Richard, you were involved, so you know very well about what, what went on there. Right? And then next time, you have the President Chen Sui Bian's years, a lot of surprises in U.S.-China relations, and which leads to... Uh, to President Bush kind of uh, speaking in front of Wen Jiabao, the Chinese premier who was visiting the White House at that time, saying that he, he was opposed to any unilateral change of the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. And so those were kind of the, uh, the bad years. Uh, and, but more recently, it has changed. Uh, that is that uh, President Tsai Ing-wen, she has uh, avoided no surprises and also avoided not to provoke China. And, and so... So she, she also says that she understands and respects the historical fact of the 1992 consensus, which was a talk uh, between the two sides, and, and basically it's uh, one China principle, one China position, but with different interpretations from the Taiwan's perspective. And, and so she kind of offered a lot of confrontational stands, uh, stands uh, when she took office. Right? But on the other hand, China does not accept that because China's position is very rigid. Right? It's only one China. And this is the precondition you have to accept before coming into any dialogue with China. And that, in my view, is not helpful uh, for any kind of negotiations because you have to accept a precondition before uh, coming to talk. But, but that's what it is. Right? And that position, I don't expect it to change. And also China has been suspicious of the DPP, uh, the, the, the ruling party today, because it thinks that, that the DPP wants to have uh, de jure independence and do not, does not want unification. So on that, DPP agrees in some form to the, uh, the one China issue. I do not see any movement uh, on that regard. But there's an election coming out in, 20, uh, in, uh, in 2020, so that may, uh, some, that may change, but we don't, uh, we don't know for sure. And finally, about... Uh, assessing the changing quality of Taiwan's democracy. Uh, this is not an easy assignment, but, but I would say that from what I can see, that Taiwan is a vibrant democracy. It has genuine freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Basically, today in Taiwan, you can say anything, even the Chinese flag. You can fly the Chinese flags uh, in Taiwan uh, without uh, any consequences. Right? And so it's, it's a very free and open society. Right? And and also, Taiwan has experienced two-party turnovers. So the DPP and the KMT, they have basically switched power uh, twice, at least twice, uh, in the past 20 years. So, so Taiwan's democracy has become uh, more mature and also uh, more consolidated. But on the other hand, uh, I see three concerns when it comes to uh, Taiwan's democracy. And first is China's influence operations and... And in the past, China tries to influence Taiwan's domestic politics through intimidation, right? So we had the 1996 Taiwan Strait crisis when China just tested launch missiles uh, uh, around the, the two ports in Taiwan, right? and or issue uh, military threats. Right? When the year 2000, President, uh, Premier Zhu Longji said the Chinese people are uh, willing to shed blood if Taiwan declares independence. Right? And those backfire. Right? And China has learned its lessons, right? 
And so now it's trying to do somewhat differently uh, through the influence operations. Right? And so we know that China now has bigger sticks, right? But it also has bigger carrots now. Right? So recently it announced the 31 measures, basically treating uh, Taiwanese citizens uh, who are uh, to go to mainland China and live and work there, and they are treated just like uh, they, they were Chinese citizens, given all the rights and benefits. And the strategy is to win hearts and minds right, uh, in Taiwan. And, and, that, and China is also trying to influence Taiwan's media. So uh, there are media that's very friendly to China, and, but, but also uh, there's a kind of clandestine support of actors who are aligned with China's uh, agenda. And so because Taiwan's society is quite divided, and so that kind of gives uh, uh, China a, an opening to exploit the kind of uh, uh, domestic uh, division. And the second concern that I see is that there's, Taiwan has no consensus on how to deal with China. And that is a, a problem because the China factor dominates Taiwan's domestic politics. If you look at elections and all kinds of political issues, it's all about China. But, and so the Taiwan's domestic parties are divided between the green and the blue parties right, on the both sides. And, but, but they do not agree on how to deal with China. Right? So that kind of opens up a space for China to kind of manipulate that kind of domestic division. Right? So it's very polarized, yeah? just like the United States. Right? So when we talk about politics, it's all polarized. And Taiwan is, is also pretty much polarized. Right? And so, but the problem here is that if there's no consensus on how to deal with China, how are you going to do that? Right? And so that's a, 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 a big issue for, uh, for Taiwan leaders to think about. And, and, Taiwan likes to, and China and Taiwan like to use the term, we should set aside our differences to seek common ground. And I think that principle also applies to the two political parties in Taiwan. They need to set aside their differences and seek common ground when it comes to how to deal with China. And finally, it's about uh, the rise of populism. Taiwan is not immune from the global trend uh, in, the, in, the, in that kind of anti-establishment sentiment. And you see the rise of Han Guoyi and other political leaders. That is that people are tired of traditional politicians. They want a fresh face, someone who can speak directly to the people and use the language that people can understand. And, and so people do not like the political fights between the two political parties. They are tired and sick of that. And so I'm looking for uh, an alternative. And the upcoming election in 2020, it, could open you know, space, avenue for alternative candidates because people want to get things done and, and improve their economic conditions. So for, and in the end, I would just like to add that democracy is Taiwan's biggest asset because just a few days ago, uh, I have a Chinese student, you know, and, and she came to me and she was very concerned about freedom of speech in China because there was a professor who was kind of fired at Tsinghua University, she's on red. And she came to me and says that, well, Taiwan must keep its democracy because that kind of freedom uh, would be a beacon uh, to the Chinese people. And I think that democracy is Taiwan's biggest asset. So Taiwan needs to do everything it can to protect it. Thank you. Final speaker, maybe I can uh, I can be the bridge. You uh, are the privilege. I've earned the privilege, or I, I'll be the bridge between uh, speaking and. Um between uh, our, our speaking engagements and, and the uh, discussion. Um, it was correct uh, when uh, Richard mentioned I had lived uh, quite a bit in Asia, in fact, about two decades of my life. Um, roughly split between uh, China and Southeast Asia, a little more in Southeast Asia. I might go a little further back, Richard, than our assignment today. But um, in 1972, uh, when I was about yay high, um, I was uh, uh, living in northern Thailand for a few months. Uh, my father had a sabbatical leave uh, from the academic world. Um, and I fell in love with the temples and the rice fields and the uh, spicy food. Um, it was only uh, quite a few years later that I realized um, that I had been there in that place at a very pivotal time uh, in the region's history. War and revolution were just across the border in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, um, and an anti-communist grouping of sorts, uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, 
uh, had sort of uh, formed a bridge uh, or a divide in the region uh, to press back, uh, including uh, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand. Um, and that, that sort of divide um, would last uh, about 20 years. Uh, the Khmer Rouge, of course, uh, committed genocide uh, in Cambodia. Um, the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia. Uh, eventually, there was a uh, huge peacekeeping operation called the United Nations Transitional Authority for Cambodia. Uh, Richard knows a lot about that. Uh, peacekeepers came from uh, around the world, uh, also engineering battalions from both China and Japan, uh, interestingly. Um, I was part of that uh, mission, uh, and I remember it like yesterday. Uh, but uh, though it was flawed in some ways, and we still have Hun Sen in power in Cambodia today, um, it was another pivotal moment that I think helped to remove a lot of longstanding divisions uh, in the region and basically provide opportunities for growth and regional integration. Um, over the next few minutes, uh, I'm going to sort of touch on uh, three aspects of the region uh, that Richard asked me to uh, respond to. Um, and one is sort of how, how did the region evolve? What were the main aspects uh, for the next 20 years after that? And how is it responding, secondly, to China's rising influence? And finally, how are domestic politics in Southeast Asia affecting regional relations uh, more generally? So in the broadest strokes, um, I would say that two characteristics defined Southeast Asia over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, one uh, would be economic dynamism, and another would be successful multilateralization or multilateralism uh, generally. So uh, from uh, after uh, peace was achieved in Cambodia, for instance, uh, ASEAN uh, expanded eventually to 10 members. Uh, Vietnam joined in 1995, Myanmar and Laos in 97, and finally Cambodia in 99. This uh, gave the members sort of uh, added weight. In a sense, uh, the expression punch above your weight uh, was often assigned uh, to ASEAN because uh, individual states could participate in this collective institution and have more influence uh, internationally and regionally that they could than they could possibly have as individual states. There was the emergence of, of the notion of ASEAN centrality, uh, the idea that ASEAN kind of provides an institutional platform within which other regional institutions are anchored in the Asia-Pacific region. There's also uh, um, efforts by ASEAN to define the terms of the region uh, and mesh great powers and manage great power uh, rivalry. We can argue about how effectively that was done. But I think the most important point, and, and this gets, I think, to some remarks that Bruce made earlier and that really is the premise of this larger project, um, this multilateralism helped to foster stability, integration, and really conditions for economic growth uh, going forward. And if you look at, at what the region has achieved, you know, if taken together, uh, the 10 countries of ASEAN now are the third largest economy in Asia and the fifth in the world. They're the fourth largest export region in the world, and they are the top destination for U.S. investment in Asia, more than total U.S. investment in China, India, Japan, and Korea combined. And ASEAN is also big, again, if taken together. Uh, they're the third, most popula third largest population in the world at 630 million. Indonesia alone, of course, is 265 million, the fourth most populous nation in the world. Um, kind of echoing uh, some of Yun Sun's uh, comments earlier and getting to the second point I'm addressing, which is how is the region responding uh, to China's growing influence? Um, uh, I think, as, as Yun Sun pointed out, um, China has been uh, uh, kind of practicing a more uh, aggressive and proactive form of neighborhood diplomacy, promoting uh, the concept of a community of common destiny in the region. They do couch this in terms of inclusiveness and win-win cooperation, um, but there are, of course, concerns that this is sort of a broader effort to kind of integrate neighboring countries into a Sinocentric uh, network along uh, different dimensions, whether it be security, culture, and economics, and so on. Of course, their aggressive island building in the South China Sea uh, is a prominent aspect of this. And it has created uh, divisions uh, within ASEAN. Obviously, there are some claimant states and some non-claimant states who may have different perspectives on how hard to push back, for instance. 
But at this stage in the region, it's really an economic game. Uh, economic statecraft by China, I think, is rapidly emerging as their principal tool, tool of uh, leverage through inducements and coercion, with BRI being really the most visible platform. This is particularly true um, in mainland Southeast Asia, uh, along the Mekong, uh, for instance, where there's growing concerns about China creating a sphere of influence, for instance. There's an expression one increasingly hears in the region that we focus so much on the sea, we forgot about the land. Concern, for instance, that um, China's efforts or uh, ongoing, um, the ongoing reality of having increasing influence in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, for instance, um, may have longer-term ramifications for, chi for divisions within ASEAN than the South China Sea. Now, ASEAN largely welcomed the Belt and Road Initiative um, from a strictly economic standpoint, um, but it also uh, has started to feel some unease over contract terms, transparency, uh, debt issues, and so on. But there's still quite a strong demand, and I think uh, Mahathir's uh, in Malaysia's recently de uh, recent decision to go ahead, for instance, with the East, East Coast uh, Rail Link, uh, is some evidence of that. I also think that um, there is kind of a dynamic of mutual learning going on in the region, um, where ASEAN is itself getting smarter uh, how to manage BRI, uh, and China is learning from its implementation mistakes and making adjustments. And I think this will probably make BRI more sustainable uh, in Southeast Asia over the long term. And we certainly saw ASEAN uh, showing its support for uh, BRI uh, last week at the BRI Forum in Beijing. I think nine of ten ASEAN leaders attended. The only one who didn't was uh, Jokowi from Indonesia, uh, and he was uh, dealing with uh, election results that went his way. Uh, but uh, it wasn't a snub. I think he was just staying home for domestic political reasons. And I think as ASEAN looks to the future, um, they're going to sort of think about what China's economic footprint is going to be in 10, year, 10 or 20 years, calculate their likely interdependencies, inter, uh, and calibrate their, their policies toward China accordingly. Um, finally, the third point uh, Richard asked me to address is, is sort of the changing uh, domestic politics in the region. Right now, I think the conventional wisdom uh, is that uh, democracy has been declining in Southeast Asia for several years. Um, people point to the military coup in Thailand in 2014, uh, Duterte's drug war and extrajudicial killings in the Philippines, Hun Sen's uh, disillusion of other political parties and muzzling of the media, for instance, in Cambodia, and concerns about rise of religious and, and political intolerance uh, in Indonesia. And even um, the glow of sort of Aung San Suu Kyi's historic victory in 2015 in Myanmar uh, is dimming as, you know, nearly 800,000 Rohingya refugees uh, have escaped into Bangladesh uh, to escape ethnic cleansing. Um, but there are still conspicuous examples of uh, democratic practice. Uh, we saw, for instance, um, uh, that UMNO, the, uh, the ruling party since 1957 uh, in Malaysia, lost power. Uh, in 2018. Uh, also, importantly, Indonesia just conducted its fourth direct presidential election since the country uh, democratized in 1999. And that in itself, I think, uh, should give some hope for what, what looks to be an increasingly consolidated and maturing democracy. But I think what, what all of this means to me in some ways is, uh, and it reflects, a kind of uh, domestic imperative that we see in, in the region, a messiness, if you will, um, that may kind of undermine ASEAN cohesiveness or at least its ability to sort of effectively manage regional and international issues as it has in the past. But these are new realities, and I think even if these countries are not high-functioning uh, democracies, all of them, they are increasingly beholden to domestic interests, concerns, and problems, and I don't think that's going to change. Um, there's one big issue, of course, we didn't address, which is um, U.S. policy toward the region. Um, and uh, what I just described, I think, along different dimensions has big implications uh, for U.S. policy uh, to Southeast Asia and the broader Indo-Pacific. Um, if anybody's interested, we could, of course, address that uh, in the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thanks to all of you.
Um, I, I won't try to sum up um, all of your insights. Uh, I won't. Uh, I think I will forego a discussion here up on the stage so we have more time for questions from the audience. Um, Maria? Uh, thank you very much. Mireya Solis, I'm the director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies, and thank you so much for the panelists. Uh, I wasn't at Brookings when many of you were visiting fellows, so it's a wonderful opportunity uh, to have you here. Um, so I have two questions. One is for Ayon and Toshi. Um, Toshi mentioned that 20 years ago it made sense to talk about the friendship framework to discuss Japan-China relations. So how would you characterize these relations today? What framework makes sense? Um, and the second question, this is putting uh, Toshi my Japan hat. I enjoyed very much your presentation. I, I very much agree with uh, um, the argument you made that the past 20 years have been a period of transition for Japan allowing Japan to be more active in the global stage. I want to talk about some of the domestic challenges to sustain that global leadership at the bottom and at the top. What I mean is public opinion. When you think about the country's international engagement, there are some issues that certainly uh, create a lot of uh, interest, sometimes controversy, um, trade, security, immigration. And I think that it's interesting to uh, look at opinion uh, uh, trends in Japan on these three issues. On trade, uh, there was a very decided opposition based on agricultural uh, uh, resistance, but we don't see that anymore. We don't see, uh, as many of you also remarked for other countries, we don't see a populist backlash. So that's an interesting phenomenon. Where is the anti-trade phenomenon in Japan? On security, you do see much more sensitivity, and there were mobilizations during the uh, diet deliberations on the 2015 security uh, uh, bills. So would that be a hard constraint uh, for Japan to do more? And third, I think the big surprise is that we always think of Japan as a homogeneous country that was very reluctant to open up to uh, immigrants, but there was a revision recently uh, to the immigration bill, allowing for the first time non-skilled workers to come to the country. And this is early days, but nevertheless, we don't see a, a public opinion showing a, a, a decided backlash against that proposition. So how do you see public opinion constraining Japan's global engagement? And at the top, leadership. Uh, you mentioned two of uh, Japan's strongest prime ministers of recent uh, uh, years, uh, Prime Minister Koizumi and Prime Minister Abe. Uh, and one of the questions that all Japan hands are now talking about is what happens after Abe? Um, would Japan go back to that period of uh, instability of one prime minister a year? Would Prime Minister Abe at some point decide that he actually wants to stay for a fourth term, or if not, can there be an, another strong leader with a strong commitment to the global stage emerging from the ranks of the LDP uh, um, circles or from other parties? Uh, but as you mentioned, the, the chances are not great for, uh, for that possibility. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll go with the, the Chinese perception of the, of the framework. I think in the, in the Chinese perception, the relationship with Japan will largely remain competitive. Although there are periods of practical considerations and practical cooperation, like for example, now they have the Sino-Japanese cooperation on third country issues. And basically, the Chinese see that as cooperation under BRI. And they see that as a more uh, benevolent attitude Japan has demonstrated towards uh, the, the BRI. But for China, the most important question is what is Japan's alignment choices looking into the future? And this is particularly true given the um, uncertainty associated with the Trump administration's policy towards Asia. What is the future of the of the alliance? I don't think the Chinese bear any illusion that Japan will want to remain as a firm ally of the of the United States. But is uh, is the U.S. as an ally reliable to Japan's satisfaction? I think that's uh, a primary factor that determines how China sees Japan and how Japan sees China. Well, I agree that uh, the, uh, the relations would remain competitive. But because of the sort of the vicinity, the, the fact that we're close, we have no option but to sort of search for cooperation. Right? We don't want sort of direct conflict with China. So competition, but at the same time, try somehow to manage it and seek a space where we could cooperate. I, and I think that's what we're exactly doing now on BRI. So some people here in Washington would say that even a country like Japan is hedging because they're worried about the U.S. 
uh, you know, commitment to Asia. But I, I don't quite buy that, and I, I tell to those people, don't use Japan to criticize your own president. Right? And uh, I, I think, you know, for the past seven or eight years, uh, relations between Japan and China was really bad. Right? So it was like minus 10. So now we're only sort of bringing it up to like minus one or zero. So I think there's a, you know, uh, I think that's the, the general perception and the sort of the distrust is quite strong. So if, if, you know, the perception in Japan is that if you pile up what China is doing in the region, uh, many Japanese people, not just the people in the government, but even in the business community to a certain degree, they see hegemonic ambitions. So I think that's, that lies at the sort of the, you know, the, the core of uh, uh, Japanese people's perception towards China. And on your sort of a, a question about sort of, you know, uh, public opinions and how that would constrain uh, Japan's global commitment, you know, I, I would need a, a, a long time to answer that, but I'm not going to sort of, uh, you know, because uh, I don't have time. But I would say that uh, in terms of immigration, it is interesting that there isn't that much of a, you know, a backlash yet. But if we actually see many people coming in as, you know, foreign workers, that might be. Uh, but, you know, Japan is a pretty secular society, right? And we don't have this religious, uh, you know, a, a core belief or religion. So if you actually sort of walk around talking, you see foreigners all over. If you go into a convenience store, you would see a foreigner, you know, behind the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the counter, right? And totally okay with us. Right? So maybe we're more adaptable than we think. We think, because of there's no core religious belief. As long as they can fit into our custom and to this language, they don't have to speak perfect language or anything. But you know, minimum minimum level of communication. Maybe we're, we'll be able to adapt to that. So I'm being a bit optimistic these days. Uh, the gentleman in the Nike cap, right there. Um, thank you very much for a very good presentation. Um, um, my name is Elliot Hurwitz. I would like a, to ask a question of uh, Wang Kang Yang, Wang Kang Wang. Sorry for that, um, or anyone else. Um, in the current uh, election in Taiwan, uh, I think a man named Terry Gu is running, and he's the head of Foxconn. And um, I think you know the rest of the question. Um, they have a very uh, strong, they have very strong sales in the PRC, and um, I'd like you to discuss that election, please. Well, uh, Terry Go uh, has been compared to President Trump because they were both business people and very successful uh, in that regard. And he recently announced that he will uh, run for the KMT nomination. And, but the, the most recent rules passed by the KMT is to, to use public opinion service. By the way, Taiwan's political party doesn't have good primary systems. It's kind of very ad hoc. Unlike the US, very established primary systems, but Taiwan's political parties, they keep changing the rules about who, uh, who the leading candidates will be. But if you look at the public opinion service, Terry Gore is uh, number two. Number one is still Han Guoyi. So, uh, 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 it's hard to predict who, who's going to be the free, uh, front runner uh, for the KMT. But either way, if you look at uh, uh, Han Guoyu and also uh, Terry Guo, uh, the Foxcom uh, CEO, and they are both untraditional politicians. Right? It, it kind of fits into this kind of a global wave of populism. That is that people are kind of tired, sick and tired of traditional politicians. And these two offers, uh, offer... Uh, very different alternative, and they, they are all straight talkers. They, they don't you know, use all the rhetoric as traditional politicians would, would like to do. They all use plain languages that people can understand, and that, that's where their appeal uh, is. Right? So uh, I cannot make a prediction, but it's interesting to watch. Yeah. Just one observation on Terry Guo. Um, the, his start as a candidate uh, didn't work out well, because as soon as he announced, his wife left him. <laughs> and uh, if you, excuse me, she came, back in she, came, she came back in a week. Well, but there's a Confucian principle. If you can't rule your own household, how can you rule a kingdom, right? Um, so do we have another question? 
Okay, we'll go here, here, and here. The gentleman with the set of workers. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. I'd like to direct this to Young Sun. Uh, I, I really appreciated your summary of some of the latest uh, statements from China about the uh, community of uh, benevolence and the, the moral order. Uh, so my question is, uh, there was one period in my life when I sort of dabbled in some Chinese philosophy and you had Confucianism and Neo-Confucianism and so forth and so on. I mean, it's a massive subject. So, so the question is, in your opinion, if we had some experts here who were also connected to the State Department or diplomacy or whatever, National Security Council, who had background in uh, traditional Confucian philosophy and so forth and so on, do you think that would help them one iota in understanding the moves that China is likely to make. And also, uh, it's, it's actually a good question, I thought, because I've seen some internal U.S. government reports on Xi, Xi Jinping, and he's actually quite a serious person in terms of religious beliefs and this and that and this and that, which, which you don't often pick up from the public image. So, so what do you think? Would, would, it, would our better understanding of this whole traditional uh, Chinese worldview help us better to deal with China in any way? I think it, I think it does, and I think it would. So we know that the Confucianism or the Chinese traditional culture was very much uh, destroyed or damaged during the Cultural Revolution. But I would say that old habits die hard. And if you look at the Chinese bureaucratic politics, the tradition of a lot of the, um, the 2,000 years of accumulation of the Confucianism still applies today. And if you talk to Chinese officials today within the bureaucratic system, you hear very similar descriptions compared to what has happened in the, in the Chinese history. And in, in particular, between the domestic political philosophy and the Chinese foreign policy behavior, I'll just point out one thing, which is the, the, the hierarchy the, the world vision and the country, the vision of the country is based on hierarchy. That not the, for example, the society is harmonious not because everyone is created equal, but because everyone has assigned a designated role according to their moral competence and the material competence. And as long as everybody observes their own role, the the harmony and stability will be will be maintained. And I think China's foreign policy behavior or the hegemonic rights is very much modeled upon that that belief in hierarchy. My name is Ye Wanji. I'm a reporter from Radio Free Asia. And I have a question on, on one of the most important security issues in the region, that's North Korea. Um, and yesterday, uh, North Korea's um, first Vice Foreign Minister Choi Son Yi said in the same media that the United States should change its calculations and positions um, by the end of this year. And the United States is still maintaining um, the, the big deal approach um, in dealing with North Korea. So do you think that uh, it is possible to narrow, narrow the differences in in terms of the um, the approach to the North Korea's nuclear issues, and and how can you how can you break the deadlock in the negotiations? Oh, okay, Chef Well, um, that's very tough questions. Um, actually, I think. Um, the, by the end of this year, uh, it's very important. So how many months? We have uh, about uh, seven months, right? Uh, we believe uh, Mr. Trump has very special leadership, right? So this is summit diplomacy, uh, the, trying to, to resolve the North Korea's nuclear issues from the top rather than bottom up, will uh, create uh, some momentum. And actually, uh, President Trump uh, has been saying, uh, you know, very uh, good words to, to Kim Jong Un. So, so we'll believe this top-down solution um, uh, has changed compared to the previous U.S. government uh, approach. Uh, however, after this uh, failure of a No Deal uh, from the uh, the Hanoi summit, um, 
I guess uh, the U.S., um, especially State Department, and many believe, especially the, the, uh, Mr. Bolton, um, they are asking uh, Yongbyon plus Alpha, and plus Alpha must be, I think, uh, according to the news, you know, the North Korea should... Uh, uh, the report the list, and the USA is asking to bring out some nuclear weapons and missiles and so forth. But of course, uh, Kim Jong Un and his team is saying that's very unilateral. We are not going to submit to that kind of wish. Um, so they are kind of uh, uh, the 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 uh, trying to, to persuade and and uh, the White House. But I don't think uh, it will work. Because Mr. Trump, as he's getting more uh, driven to the next presidential election, that will be very hard from the next year. Um, I don't think he will compromise, as he had said in the Hanoi summit, uh, sometimes no deal is better than the bad deal. <laughs> so I think it's time for Pyongyang, uh, Kim Jong-un, to come up with the more uh, incentivizing the White House to, 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 to continue to talk but just blaming the, the leadership and asking the White House, the USA, to change the calculus, I think they are losing momentum. If they are really serious about why they build up nuclear weapons to, to get the USA to, to the negotiation table, they shouldn't, they shouldn't waste the important timing because time is ticking up. A gentleman right here? Who, uh, yes. Uh, and that, this will be the last question. Uh, Chris McRae, Norman McRae Foundation. But, uh, basically, a question to. Uh, a question to any of you. Do, do you actually do research between under 30s, between your nations? Uh, this is something our foundation does a lot of. Um, we really don't find conflicts between Chinese youth and Japanese youth and Korean youth. For example, I was at the AIB summit in Korea in 2017, which was also the first time Moon Jae-in uh, spoke abroad or, or to an international audience. And really, all the young, you know, under 30s, I really just want to get on with work, want to get on with building communities. After all, you have half a billion under 30s in China. Uh, Chinese people are still only have a quarter of the wealth of, let's say, Americans. And most of those people in 20 to 30 are, you know, in one-child families. So they're absolutely responsible for the whole family tree. And so there's a huge degree of responsibility, I would suggest, amongst youth across many of these Asian nations, and I don't see the sorts of conflicts in what they want to do and what they want to do with technology and with small enterprises that seem to be, you know, top of all of your minds. Can I go? Uh, at Keio University in Tokyo, I manage this uh, Keio, Hudan, Yonsei sort of trilateral sort of university, you know, exchange. And of course, you know, the students there, they love to, you know, chat and they love to do project together. And that's always there. But if... And, but that's uh, too much of an optimistic vision, because uh, if, you, if you take the, the group as a whole, uh, they're not that different than the older generation, I think, as a, as a group. And the people that who would be involved in, you know, interested in involving themselves in those exchanges, sure. I mean, they're, they're willing to cooperate and all that. But uh, at the, uh, you know, more sort of you know, larger level, I think the difficulty, is, you know, we tend to think that, you know, when, when this younger generation would have their voice, things would solve. I don't think it's that optimistic. And, and I didn't go into our difficulties with Korea. But it is extremely difficult. And that is shared even among the younger generation as well. Before, it was always Japan doing something, something, and then Korean, you know, Korean was, would react. But this time around, it's... Koreans doing something, and the J Japanese would really react, you know, you know, in a, in a very hard, hard way. So I don't see, you know, that younger generation is is the solution to the difficult issues that we're seeing. And I think that's the same with the rise of sort of nationalism in, in, in younger generation in China as well. Um, with that, I think we'll bring this panel to a close. The next panel is ready to go. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention and your great questions. And thanks to the panelists. 
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.